In the first video dedicated to the unfinished sarcophagus, some errors and inaccuracies were made, which affect the final conclusions. Thanks to your comments, they were identified, for which I am grateful. First, the saw was not made of pure copper but of an alloy, or naturally contains impurities. Producing pure copper requires specialized technologies and was unlikely necessary for toolmaking in ancient Egypt. Copper alloys generally have greater hardness. At the same time, in some cases, brittleness may increase. This means that using a thin saw was impossible. The issue of metallurgy in ancient Egypt has been studied for a hundred years, and the topic of copper hardening has often been presented as lost technology. However, research has shown that hardening was achieved through forging, resulting in plastic deformation. No complex alloys have been found. When using work hardening through forging, it is possible to obtain bronze comparable in properties to air-cooled steel. Quenched steel, of course, would be significantly harder. At the same time, only a relatively small number of artifacts have been analyzed, primarily because burial sites contained model tools, symbolic copies of real items, likely due to the high value of metal. Naturally, one should not expect extraordinary properties from model artifacts. In other cases, tools from dumps were analyzed. The reasons why relatively unworn tools were discarded remain unclear. The hardness of the examined samples does not indicate anything unusual and is characteristic of arsenical bronze. It is assumed that the presence of arsenic is not due to its initial content in the ore, but rather its intentional use to improve the metal's properties. The arsenic content itself is low. The saw's dimensions are determined by the shape of the cut. Its thickness indicates that strong metals were not known. This same argument disproves the possibility of high-precision machines and ultra-strong alloys. The cut width would have been smaller and uniform rather than widening. Accordingly, the final conclusion in the first part, that the saw was large and had an increased contact area, remains valid. However, it should be clarified that two people would not be enough to operate such a massive tool, where friction creates significant resistance. This is why historical reconstructions depict a model that assumes the involvement of more people. This implies an even larger saw, which explains the significant widening of the cut. In experiments with large saws, the effort of two people was sufficient. However, the saws had a different shape, which minimized side friction. The material of the saws was also different. Steel was used. Additionally, the slight curvature of some traces which serves as the basis for hypotheses about giant circular saws, may be due to a pendulum-like movement. There are also factors that cannot be accounted for in a scaled-down reconstruction. For example, when working with a heavy saw, the increased contact area proportionally increases the force required, now involving a group of people, and impact effects may also occur. This could explain the presence of atypical traces in the form of deep scratches directly in the cutting zone. In experiments on sawing and drilling granite, the ratio of copper consumption to the mass of crushed granite was found to be 1-2. Given the size of the sarcophagus and a cut width of 3 cm, this results in a requirement of 117 kg of copper. Additionally, once significant wear occurs, further sawing becomes impossible, increasing the need for frequent tool replacement. In practice, this means that at least two saws, each weighing up to 70 kilograms, were required for a single sarcophagus lid, considering that full utilization until complete wear was not feasible. Moreover, if half of the lid required one saw, this implies a rapid reduction in the saw's width due to wear. As a result, the shape of the cut would not remain consistently wide with a broad base, but would instead progressively narrow from start to finish as the saw wore down over time. This makes sawing by this method only a hypothetical possibility. It is evident that some factor remains unaccounted for. For instance, instead of considering the consumption of pure copper, the focus should be on its alloys. The experiments used copper, which clearly has different properties. Thus, the actual material consumption might differ. On the other hand, when using an abrasive at low speeds, the key factor is not the strength of the metal base, but the properties of the abrasive itself, and whether it is used in a free or fixed form. It is also generally assumed that the copper alloy was lost irreversibly. 
However, the possibility of collecting the resulting metal particles for later remelting should be considered. Using a groove in the stone and water could have preserved both the abrasive and bronze dust, which would settle at the bottom of a container. The Egyptians were highly skilled in gold extraction, and could efficiently separate gold dust. However, due to tool wear, the resulting metal particles would likely have been so fine that remelting was improbable. Furthermore, simply remelting arsenical bronze presents difficulties, as it can become brittle. On the other hand, these attempts could have inadvertently created an alloy with embedded corundum or quartz particles. This would have led to the natural formation of an ancient tool with a fixed abrasive, which is more effective than using a free abrasive. This could also explain the presence of scratches in the cutting area. Thus, the destruction of horn blend might not have resulted from extraordinary methods, but from temperature fluctuations and the specific mechanical processes involved in sawing. Time estimates should also be reconsidered. The large size of the saw and the particular features of its use could have actually shortened the overall processing time, despite the wider cut. Estimates of a cutting speed of one month, with a bronze consumption of 37 kilograms per square meter of surface area, are sufficient for producing sarcophagi, as unique objects whose creation justified prolonged resource expenditures of all kinds. However, this method is clearly unsuitable for constructing a granite pyramid casing, neither in terms of time nor metal consumption. The fact that this method was widely used indicates its high efficiency. This suggests that drilling could also have been performed using different and equally effective methods, which contradicts some existing models of stone working. The idea of harnessing water or wind energy for this work, similar to later developments in other regions, is tempting. However, there is currently no supporting evidence for this hypothesis. Third clarification. The large size of the saw both in length and width, would have made it impossible to change the cutting direction while the lid remained intact, regardless of whether the saw broke or remained whole. A change in direction could only occur before a section was cut off. It is likely that the saw did break. The shift in angle suggests an attempt to modify the work process, as a continuous saw would have kept cutting in the same direction, even if the lid had sustained damage. This also explains why the saw was not reworked. Producing such a massive tool required significant effort. Additionally, the sarcophagus was created near the end of the golden era of stoneworking, when this craft was already in decline. It is unclear whether rapid production of such a tool was even possible at that time. This would also clarify why large saws have not been found in archaeological excavations. They were highly valuable tools. Extremely valuable. They were used until completely worn out or broken after which their fragments were either remelted or repurposed into smaller tools. Final conclusions, accounting for bronze use, the large size of the saw, and possibly different work organization. The cut is the result of a tool that did not possess supernatural strength properties. Several aspects need explanation. Polishing of the side surfaces, while drilling cores retain scratches, Polishing could have been achieved by constant contact between the saw's sides and the stone in the presence of fine abrasive particles. However, with water flow, the abrasive would have been washed away from the saw's sides, making sawing impossible. Only a thick paste could have been added. Key consideration at the end. If saw wear led to a continuous reduction in its thickness, the cut would indeed have been progressively narrowing. But how would the next saw be inserted into it? This would require starting the cut anew, or sawing from the opposite side. However, in that case, the lid would have had an irregular shape, requiring additional finishing, including adjustments at the corners. This contradicts the very idea of making a clean cut to obtain a ready-to-use piece. To avoid such issues, the saw's shape should be different, maintaining a constant width. This way, wear would not affect the cut width and its shape would remain almost consistent, except for the final section. Yet, we see an entirely different shape, with continuous, narrowing. Efficiency concerns. Using multiple giant saws for a single cut does not seem like a viable solution. This leads to only one conclusion. The examined cut represents a survivorship bias. Conclusions cannot be drawn based on a single artifact where a production failure occurred. This inevitably led to altered tool marks. 
Therefore, the findings must be compared with other objects, and this will be done in the following videos. Thank you for watching, liking, and commenting. See you next time.